Hi everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica, I am the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight are two of our students who are probably familiar faces if you've been here before, but I'm still going to let them introduce themselves. And we will start off, and I can't differentiate because you both have auroras, so let's start off with Eli. Hi, my name is Eli, I'm a physics and astronomy undergrad at UMD. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. So tonight we are going to talk all about telescopes because over the holiday season, we know that uh, a lot of you may be interested in purchasing your first telescope for yourself or a loved one. And that can kind of be a daunting task if you don't quite know what it is you're looking for. Um, or what you know, good reliable brands or, are, or you know, what you need, and so that's what we're going to be doing tonight: is telling you a little bit of background on the different types of telescopes, giving you our recommendations for great beginners telescopes, what to look for, what to avoid, and then we'll also give you a little bit of an insight of what your first time using your telescope is going to look like, and some of the great targets to start off with. Um, so, as usual, if you do have any questions for us throughout the show tonight, leave them down in the comments. Eli is going to be keeping an eye on those for me and will let me know if those questions pop up. Otherwise, we will also have time at the end to take your questions. Um, so, with that, let me get switched over and get going. All right. So as I said, we are going to be going through our beginner's guide to telescopes today. And we are starting off with, very simply, the different types of telescopes that there are. Um, for telescopes themselves, there are three main types. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about is actually the first type of telescope that was made. And this is a refracting telescope or a refractor. Um, these use lenses which we have a big lens at the front of the telescope called the objective lens that collects and focuses the light to the back of the telescope where there is a second lens that magnifies and focuses the light to your eye. Um, as I said, this was the first telescope design made all the way back in the early 1600s. Um, it is a common misconception that Galileo invented the telescope. Um, he did not. It was invented by uh, lens makers in Holland. But Galileo, we think, was the first, or at least one of the first, to turn this contraption to the skies and use it to observe the heavens. Um, now, these telescopes um, are usually, uh, you could tell what type it is, because these tend to be long and skinny. Um, and a lot of the very cheap telescopes are refracting telescopes, and they are able to be so cheap because the lenses that are in them are very poorly made. Um, and of course, that means you're not going to have a good quality telescope looking through it. Um, now, there is a major downside to a refracting telescope and using a lens in a telescope. And that's because different colors of light are bent different amounts when they pass through that lens. And so the different colors are actually going to focus at slightly different locations. And that's going to lead to an image that is a little bit fuzzy and the colors aren't perfectly lined up. This is something we call chromatic aberration. Um, this can be corrected somewhat by making, instead of a single lens, you make a compound lens with a couple of different, slightly different types of glasses fused together. Um, but of course, to do that, it gets quite expensive to make those compound lenses. And so really good refracting telescopes that minimize this chromatic aberration can get quite expensive. So our next type of telescope was actually invented in 1668 by Isaac Newton. Uh, and this is a reflecting telescope. So instead of using a lens to bend the light to focus it, a reflecting telescope uses a mirror at the back of the telescope 
to reflect the light and focus it out to your eyepiece. Um, modern reflecting telescopes tend to have a couple of different mirrors that allows the light to bounce back and forth a few times before coming out to the eyepiece. Um, what that essentially does is gives you the effect of having a longer telescope, but in a more compact design. So these telescopes can be more short and wide, and they don't have to be quite as long as the reflecting telescope. So they can be a little bit easier uh, to manage, to store, and to carry around because of that more compact design with them. Uh, these telescopes also do not have chromatic aberration because all colors of light bounce or reflect the same way. And so you don't have to worry about that. Um, that's not to say that they are without fault. Um, some different shaped mirrors are a little bit better at focusing light than others, particularly for light that hits at the edge rather than straight at the center. But an easy fix for that is to always put the thing you're looking at right in the middle of your view, uh, which is what most people would do anyway. So unless you're interested in uh, looking at everything perfectly in your field of view, uh, this is easy to get around by just centering your telescope on the one object you're looking at. Now the third type of telescope is a compound or a catadioptric telescope. This is basically the best of both worlds. It has both a mirror at the back and it also has a lens at the front. And the idea is to have both of these to correct for both faults. The mirror corrects for the chromatic aberration of the lens and the lens helps to correct for the kind of edge view effect that you can get with the mirrors. Um, now, of course, since you do have both a lens and a mirror, these types of telescopes can be very pricey because uh, you're getting both of those things and you need them of pretty high quality to be able to get all of the benefits that are supposed to come with a compound or catadioptric telescope. So based off of that, the best kind of starter telescope for your money would be a reflecting telescope. They're very simple designs, um, have minimum aberrations or quality problems if you get a good quality mirror, which we'll tell you about. Um, and they're pretty robust as well. Um, they're, they, they, they're sturdy. They're not going to like mess up um, unless you're really throwing it around, which hopefully you would be doing anyway. All right, um, well, that's not all of the choices that you're going to have. When you look at telescopes, you will see that they all sit on some kind of tripod or what we call uh, or a mount of some sort that holds the telescope and allows you to move it around to point to different places in the sky. And there are different types of telescope mounts. Um, the first type is an altitude azimuth mount, or what we call an alt-az. And it it's, sounds fancy, but really it's a left, right, up and down mount. You move it, it allows you to move the telescope left and right and move it up and down. So it's a very simple design and is definitely um, a lot more beginner friendly uh, to using these. Another common type of mount that you'll see is called an equatorial mount. These are aligned so that the telescope is lined up with the North Star, with the North Pole. And instead of moving up, down, side to side, it actually moves on like an arc. The benefit to that is because all objects in the sky as the Earth is rotating, they move across the sky along an arc. So if you were wanting to follow that, if you have that previous alt as mount, you would have to do two motions, up and over, up and over, up and over, or down and over to track it. But with the equatorial, because it's tilted and moves on an arc, you just have one motion that you need to move the telescope on to follow something across the sky. And that sounds like it's better, except these telescopes do have, or these mounts do have 
a bit of a steeper learning curve because you have to set them up correctly and you have to orient them so that they are facing directly north and so that they are angled to be directly in line with the North Pole. And that's, of course, going to vary wherever you end up doing your observing. So there is definitely a learning curve there in how to set it up properly. And so because of that, we do recommend an altitude azimuth mount for a beginner because it's very easy to set up. It's an easy motion. And honestly, you're not going to need that arcing tracking uh, unless you start getting into like photography which would be a an intermediate or advanced step um you don't maybe not uh or you, i'm bundling my words um even with an alt as though it can still very easily be done all right um and then another type of telescope mount that you might see is a computerized or a go-to mount. Um, these are great because they have a little motor in the mount that automatically moves the telescope to track objects across the sky. They also have little computers that have catalogs of objects that you can just punch in, say, the planet Mars, and it'll automatically move the telescope there and point to where it needs to be, which sounds amazing. Uh, but again, these do have very steep learning curves because when you first set this up for your observing night, you have to be able to tell the telescope exactly where you are. And you have to be able to set it up um, by telling it kind of a couple of objects, like a couple of stars um, that are up in the sky. So for example, you would have to point it to the star Vega and then a second star so that its computer can orient itself, figure out exactly where it is, what the sky looks like. And then from there, it can go to wherever you want. Uh, so you have to have some knowledge already of the night sky to be able to set these up. So again, a great option for an intermediate or an advanced, um, maybe not the most necessary or best for a beginner unless you do have a lot of prior knowledge of the night sky already. Um, of course, these are also more expensive because of the computer uh, that comes with it. All right, um, so a few other things to think about when looking for a telescope, and that is the aperture of the telescope. So the aperture is the, the size of that big lens at the front or the big mirror at the back. Um, and the reason this matters is because telescopes are giant light buckets. The bigger it is, the more light it collects, the brighter things are going to look and the more detail you'll be able to see. And so, you know, you might think, great, that means I want as big of a telescope as I can get. And yeah, true, but there are some other things to keep in mind when deciding on a telescope size. Um, you need to think about portability and how high the telescope eyepiece is gonna end up sitting off the ground. If you are going to be taking this to different sites, different places, you wanna think about how big the scope is, how easy it is to carry and move around. If you're going to be observing with some younger kids or you know people who aren't quite as uh, vertically inclined as others, um, you'll need to think about whether you'll need a step stool or anything like that. And so in this case, bigger isn't always better, especially if you're going to be carrying or um, transporting your telescope around to different sites. All right, um, now to my warning of what not to get. I know it's very tempting with the prices um, to get a very cheap telescope from a big box store, uh, especially if you're thinking, I don't know if they're going to like this or if they're going to keep this interest forever. Um, you might think of just, just getting a cheap one to start off with. And this is actually a very bad idea for many reasons. Um, first, these telescopes are cheap because they are very cheaply made 
poor quality lenses, poor quality telescope. Uh, the mount that it comes with is very wobbly, so it's going to constantly shake if people are walking around it. It may not be sturdy to stand up well. Um, it's also some false advertising. Um, they show you these like really pretty pictures on the boxes, but these are at the sizes of the telescopes, um, best for looking at the moon, and that's about it. Um, and what we often see with these really cheap telescopes is it actually can kill someone's interest in astronomy because they get so frustrated trying to use this. And uh, a passion that might have been fostered ends up being squashed because of the frustration and complication of trying to get these cheaply made telescopes to work. Um, but don't fret because a very good quality beginner's telescope really isn't that expensive. So here's our recommendation for a good beginner's telescope. You want something with that alt as mount that we talked about that goes up, down, side to side. Um, we say this because they're very easy to set up, don't require a lot of prior knowledge. Um, and again, we recommend a reflecting telescope because uh, for the price you can get a bit bigger and they're a bit sturdier. And so the best type of reflecting alt as telescope is what we call a Dobsonian telescope. Uh, you'll see that instead of being on a tripod, it's on this kind of stand here. The stand swivels side to side and the telescope tube moves up and down and it's not uh, connected. The tube can come off of the stand for easy transportation of both the stand and the telescope tube. Um, as far as size, we recommend anywhere between the four and eight inch range. Um, any smaller than four inches, and you're not gonna really be able to see more than some detail on the moon. Any bigger than eight inches, and you start getting into those portability uh, issues. So four to eight inches is a great um, range to start off with to be able to look at both the moon, solar system objects, and even some brighter deep sky objects, and still uh, be a decent size to be able to move and uh, transport the telescope wherever you would like. So when people ask for a specific, what I usually recommend is uh, a tel Dobsonian telescope from the Orion Telescope Company. Um, this is the Orion SkyQuest XT6. So it's a six inch Orion uh, or six inch Dobsonian telescope. And you can see here, um, currently it's going for $330. Uh, if you want a little bit smaller, it'll be under 300. If you want a little bit bigger, it'll be a little bit more. Um, but this is a great beginner's telescope. Lots of good views, easy to use, and very sturdy and durable, uh, especially if you have maybe some slightly younger kids that are going to use it. Um, at this point, I will mention that we are in no way associated with the Orion Telescope Company or with any of the other brands that I recommend tonight. These recommendations come off of personal experience. Uh, this is what we've used, what we know works well and does well. Uh, so not associated with this at all. Um, now the cool thing that Orion does is for just a little bit more, you can actually get a full kit that comes with a lot of other accessories as well. So the original just telescope itself comes with the telescope, a finder scope and an eyepiece. It's everything you need to get started and will be great. But if you want a little bit more, um, this kit also comes with, I believe, an additional um, eyepiece. It comes with a Barlow lens, uh, which basically increases the magnification of whatever eyepiece you're using. Uh, it comes with some sky guides, a red flashlight, which is always great for observing uh, because the red light doesn't disrupt your night vision, but still gives you light to see by. So it's definitely, you want a red flashlight if you're gonna be doing any late night observing. Um, but just a little bit more, you get some extra stuff with it. So the links to both of these, the Just Telescope itself and the Telescope Kit with these extra accessories 
are in the video description. Um, again, not affiliated. This is just from personal experience what um, we recommend for good beginner telescopes. Um, in case you're wanting to shop around or look at some other options, there are a few other brands that we recommend. Again, Orion Telescopes is great. A couple of other good ones are Apertura and Skywatcher, especially for these Dobsonian telescopes. Um, if you are looking to upgrade to a go-to computerized telescope, both Mead and Celestron make some really great ones for that. Um, again, though, these do tend to be um, yeah, these, these are more expensive because they have that computer in them as well. All right, so let's uh, finish up by talking about what's going to happen uh, the first time you use your telescope. Um, if you do end up getting something like the Orion SkyQuest or really any telescope, there may be some assembly required, required, not for the actual telescope tube itself, but for the base or the telescope mount. Um, you may have to do a little bit to put that together. Um, you'll also need to attach the finder scope to the tube. Um, this is an easy way to help you line up your telescope for the target that you want to look at. Um, and some telescopes also come with little like eyepiece racks that attach so you can just set your individual eyepieces. Uh, you don't need really many to start off with. The one that most telescopes come with is a great just to start off with. Um, and then you can pick up some others later on. But once you have assembled your telescope base and you're going out for your first night of observing, uh, the first thing you're actually going to need to do is align your finder scope. Because when you first put it on, your finder scope is not actually lined up with what you're going to see through the eyepiece of your telescope. So the way these finder scopes work is they are basically a lower magnification lens that has either a kind of crosshatch or maybe a laser target in it, depending on exactly what type of finder scope you have. Um, and so it's very easy to line up. The first thing you do is point your telescope towards something like a light pole or a tree in the distance. Mm -hmm. And you get the very tip of the light pole or the tip top of the tree at the very center of your view through the eyepiece of your telescope. And then you look through the finder scope and it'll have these adjustment screws on the side that allow you to kind of just move the finder scope a little bit so that you can get the very tip top of that light pole or that tree right centered. And once you've done that, you're good to go. Now you can um, use your finder scope to easily line your telescope to whatever you want to look at. And then you can look through the eyepiece and it'll be there. And so that's actually your next step. Uh, once you have your finder scope lined up, you're going to need to pick a target, pick an object in the sky to look for. Um, now, if you don't know the night sky very well, there are some really great phone apps that use your GPS so that you can just hold up your phone and it'll tell you what you're looking for. You can also print off star charts. That'll be maps of the sky for that night. Um, uh, you also have like that kit that I uh, showed you earlier comes with a, a um, star wheel, which is a star map that you can set for different dates and time and show you. Uh, so you'll need to pick what you want to look at, say, for example, uh, like this time of year, uh, especially coming up to December 21st, Jupiter and Saturn are great to see. Uh, and so you will line up your telescope with your target by using your finder scope. Either move so that the crosshatch in your finder scope is centered on, say, Jupiter, or the little laser point, or um, why am I blanking? Bullseye target thing, whatever your finder scope looks like. Center it in your finder scope, and then you will look through the eyepiece of your telescope. And it may not quite look right yet because you'll need to focus the telescope and they'll have just a little knob 
by where the eyepiece goes uh, and it'll just move the eyepiece kind of up or down until everything is nice and in line and in focus and then you can enjoy your beautiful sights through your telescope. Um, now throughout any of this I haven't really said much about zooming in or magnifying um, and that's because <laughs> The, the zoom or the magnification of your telescope depends on two things. The size of your telescope, but it also depends on the eyepiece that you're using. And this is why uh, once you get started and do find that this is something you're interested in doing and doing more of, you might want to get a few different eyepieces because different sized eyepieces give different magnifications. So if you want to zoom in, what you do is actually swap the eyepiece for one that will give you a higher magnification view. Um, now, a couple of things to uh, know, though, is that when you do magnify or zoom in, um, your picture or your object that you're looking at is actually going to appear a little bit fainter. And that's because you have the same amount of light coming from it, but it's spread over a bigger area. And so it's going to look a little bit fainter because it's more spread out. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is there is a limit to how much you can zoom in. Um, and that limit is just going to be determined by your, excuse me, your telescope, the um, user information, the little booklet you get will tell you what that limit is. Um, so yeah, you can't zoom in infinitely. There, there is a limit to how, how close you can zoom in, how much you can magnify. Um, and so with that, um, some really good targets to start off with, uh, with your brand new telescope, or of course the moon is a great one. It's big and bright, easy to find. And a lot of people, you know, haven't seen a good close-up view with a good telescope in this range. You can really see the details of those craters on the moon, and it's really cool to see. Um, some other really good targets are planets, especially the ones that are visible to the naked eye, because it is easier for you to align your telescope to that and find it. Um, some other things that are really cool to look at are things like the Andromeda Galaxy, uh, the Pleiades Star Cluster, both of those, again, you can find with your naked eye, so it makes it easy to align. Um, once you start getting a little bit more comfortable navigating the night sky, there are some other things you could find, like a few other uh, star clusters and nebulae that are bright, um, but you can't quite see with your naked eye, so you'll have to learn how to, like, no, it's between these two stars and point your telescope in between them. So it's a little bit, little bit step up from, from the just beginner, but definitely an easy kind of next step once you're comfortable with it. Um, and that is what we've got for tonight. That is our kind of introduction to uh, telescopes and our kind of recommendations for what you should be looking for in your first telescope, what to look, uh, what to not do, and um, looks at what the, the first kind of observing session would look like. Um, so hopefully that has helped um, for anyone who is interested in getting your very first telescope. Um, Lindsay or Eli, do you have any other advice you'd like to add to this? It takes a while to get aligning your finder scope down. Don't get yes, it does. That's what I was gonna say too. Yeah, don't get frustrated with the aligning the finder scope part. Yeah, and if you are having trouble with it, you can always reach out to us, and we can help you. Um, especially once we are out of these pandemic times, we would be more than happy to help you set up your telescope line the finder scope and teach you how to use it the first time. Um, we were hoping to actually start doing some real regular star parties this summer and then the pandemic stopped that, but we will do those once uh, it is safe to, to do so. So we are definitely here to help um, if you are having trouble with it. Um, I also didn't touch on uh, many of the kind of more intermediate telescopes or any of the computerized other than just they exist. 
If that is something you are interested in and want some help finding one of those, uh, also feel free to reach out to us because uh, we can help you with that as well. Also, buy a Telrad if you find the filters no good. Yes, yeah, so a Telrad is a type of is a brand of finder scope that is really good instead of having the the cross hatch or a single like laser point it's actually a a laser target um and is really great and again if it's something you're interested in um you can reach out to us and we can tell you more about it mm -hmm. so yeah all right um if you do have any questions because i'm not seeing any right now mm -hmm. um Now's a great time to leave them down in the comments. Um, again, the links to the telescopes that uh, I specifically mentioned are in the video description. Um, and again, we are not affiliated with them. I'm not gonna get any money for recommending these. They're just really good telescopes that we know work well. Um, so while we wait and see if any questions are going to come through, let me just tell you about what's coming up over the next couple weeks. Uh, so Saturday, we are going to do a show about the Northern Lights, the Aurora, which is great timing since uh, if it's clear tonight, for those of us here in Minnesota, especially Northern Minnesota, we might get a good Aurora show um, tonight or over in the next few nights. So definitely keep an eye out for that. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about or want to learn more about kind of what this is and how it happens, definitely come see us Saturday. And we'll tell you all that. Uh, next Wednesday, Lindsay is going to be taking us on a little journey through the history of astronomy um, and talking about some of the incredible women who made really important discoveries in the field of astronomy. And many of them are not very well known, which is sad, but that is why we do this show so that we can tell you about them. And the next Saturday, we are going to go on a journey to the moons of our solar system. There are some awesome ones to see. Um, other than that, coming up on December 21st is the great conjunction of Jupiter-Saturn, where they will look like a single bright point of light to your naked eye. Um, and in case you can't get out to see it yourself, we will be doing a telescope stream that night to show you a view through one of our telescopes. And then after the conjunction, we'll be doing a special winter solstice live stream because December 21st is also the winter solstice. And we're going to have some great um, guests with us. Bob King is going to be joining us as well as Jem Rock. So I think it's going to be a great night. A um, few other things. Wow, I've got a lot of announcements tonight, guys. Um, we are now offering private virtual shows, whether it's a private show for your family, um, or a group of friends, or if it is a virtual field trip for your class, we are offering that now. You can find those details on our website. And last but not least, we are still selling our stellar distancing t-shirts to help raise money since we have been closed since March. Um, this money from these t-shirt sales is helping us to continue to do these live streams. Um, and to offer uh, more of the events like the uh, Stellar Saturday and our Halloween event that we did. Uh, we'd like to do more of those if we can. And that is all for my announcements. <laughs> That's a lot. We've got a lot coming up. Um, but it's going to be a fun next few weeks um, before we end up taking a little bit of time off for the holidays. And then coming back fresh in 2021 with um, some... Brand new stuff. Tease, tease, tease away. Yes, got some brand new stuff coming um, that we're excited to be working on. Um, but yeah, all right. Well, again, not seeing more questions or any questions. Um, if you do end up in the future, uh, feel free to reach out to us either on our social media pages or emailing us. Um, we, we love to chat with you and definitely want to help out if you are interested in getting started in using a telescope. Um, so with that, uh, I guess we will wrap up for the night. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening and we will see you next time. Bye everyone.